Uh, my name is Rod Hills. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to moderate a, a most distinguished panel on what is surely one of the critical foreign policy issues of our day after the drawdown, Afghanistan, or how will they spend our money when our army is gone? Jerry Hyman, our first speaker, uh, will draw upon his uh, long experience, both here as, governance, as, as president of the governance program at CSIS on his trips to Afghanistan and earlier as the director of the governance programs of USAID, as well as his distinguished scholarly career. Uh, sadly, uh, Ambassador Grossman is not going to be with us today. He's uh, come down with a very bad head cold. It's disrupted his schedule, and uh, we'll miss him. But our most distinguished panel, which you can tell from the biogra biographical sketches that you have, is more than qualified to deal with the issue. Ambassador Newman and Dr. Cortesman, uh, uh, along with Jerry, are uniquely qualified to give us a, give us a look at something that uh, is uh, forbidding, to, to me at least, Jerry's going to speak for about 15 minutes. Each of the panelists will talk for six, seven, or eight minutes. We'll have a discussion amongst ourselves, and I will save a half an hour for discussions with the audience. Uh, Dr. Cordesman, Tony? Oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. Excuse me. Might have uh, a comment before the speech. It'd be easier. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, well, first, thanks for coming, uh, and thanks to you, Rod, uh, the chairman and mentor of our program, and uh, have been supportive of all of these kinds of things that we've been doing for all the whole lot of years, seven in my case, but before that, three others, and grateful for, your, for the support that you've given and the guidance. Also, thanks to um, uh, Ambassador Newman and Dr. Cordesman for being on the panel, and thanks also for um, Ambassador Grossman, who unfortunately, as you said, uh, Rod isn't, isn't able to come. Um, I welcome discussion and criticism, so this is by way, I hope, of a conversation that we'll be having. First, a word, if I could, about strategy, a word which, in my opinion, should be struck from the civilian side of the river for at least two decades, enough time for Moses to lead the children around for a couple of um, decades and get some new generations who may know what that means. So I want to use the word in a very specific way. For me, a strategy is not just a list of things you would like to do with the word strategy pasted on top of it so people will supposedly pay more attention. It is a plan by which to allocate scarce resources and to deploy them in pursuit of an objective or objectives in the face of obstacles. That's true for a medical doctor looking at a, um, at, a, at a patient. It's true for a lawyer looking, litigator looking at a trial. Uh, it's true for a commander figuring out where troops should be deployed and how they should operate. And it's true, I think, on the civilian side of a whole lot of things that we do, or it should be, but I think unfortunately isn't. So a strategy is about making choices because of limited resources. So you, if you think you can do everything, you don't need a strategy. Secondly, it's about timing and quantity and deployment. And thirdly, it's not a lot, it's not, as I said, a little of everything. In the State of the Union two, a year and a half ago, uh, President Obama said this drawdown will continue and by the end of next year, meaning December of this year, our war in Afghanistan will be over. Between 2014, beyond 2014, America's commitment to unified and sovereign Afghanistan will endure, but the nature of that commitment will change. A month earlier in a joint press conference, uh, with President Karzai, he said, and by the end of next year, meaning this year, the transition will be complete. Afghans will have full responsibility for their security, and this war will come to a responsible end. I think it's not going to come to an end responsible or otherwise, but what will be left after the drawdown is an assistance program that currently is extremely large and the promises are there for a continuation. Four billion dollars a year were promised by the uh, coalition donors in Tokyo in 2012, and the U.S. itself promised a billion of that. 
with corresponding commitments by the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, which I'll refer to as JIROA. There is, however, going to be declining assistance due to donor fatigue, to U.S. budgets, and to the failure of, the, of JIROA to meet the commitments that it promised in 2012. I think Iraq is going to turn out after the drawdown to look a lot like Iraq uh, Afghanistan is going to look a lot like Iraq and Vietnam. That is, you're going to have a hard time finding the same problem or the same event on page 27 that you used to find on page 1. The government of Afghanistan, Jairoa, has its own goals in recognition even of uh, limited resources. In the Afghanistan National Development Strategy, it provides for 22 national priority plans. 22 national priority plans, each of which is a dozen or two dozen pages long. That is what Jairoa calls a strategy. 22 priority programs is not a strategy. By 2015, it says, Afghanistan will have taken over operational responsibility for its own security and will be leading development initiatives to build on foundational investments, remember that word, and good governance, remember that word, that will pave the way to economic growth, fiscal sustainability, and sustainable human development. By 2025, 10 years later, Afghanistan will have reduced its dependence on international assistance in non-security sectors to levels consistent with other least developed nations. Peace and stability will be consolidated in the country through effective development, improved delivery of government services, and the promotion of fundamental freedoms and human rights. By 2030, five years later, achievements in development and governance will allow Afghanistan to emerge as a model of a democratically developing Islamic nation. So those are Jairoa's national development strategy goals. On the civilian side to date, the strategy, if there is one, has been driven by COIN, by the uh, um, uh, anti-insurgency uh, uh, strategy. To, and it, the civilian side was to, quote, extend the reach and legitimacy of the government of Afghanistan. It's quite possible, I suppose, with enough money and enough people and enough good luck to extend the reach, but you will not, ex assistance will not extend legitimacy of a government. That needs to be earned by the government itself. So as a goal, not a particularly achievable one. But that's no longer the case. COIN is no longer going to prevail after December 2014. And so now it will be driven, the assistance program, by the context of in Afghanistan, by performance, and by some other strategic logic, which is what I hope to explore today. What should that strategic logic be? What objectives, what resources, what allocation? The premise here is that there are three scenarios. I don't think they're very sophisticated, very simple, even simplistic. I think better ones should be developed, but for the purposes of our discussion as a way of analyzing the problem, divided into three scenarios, optimistic, pessimistic, and muddling through. What we need to avoid, I think, in the allocation of limited civilian resources is to try to do everything because everything is necessary, or alternatively, to simply div cut off, as a result of budget cuts, some of everything and keep the entire program. It seems to me we need to make some, again, strategic choices about the allocation of these resources. And we need to deal with choices imposed by the realities on the ground. My argument is that three elements are determinative of which scenario will prevail and which programs should be prioritized. Security, which is the military's responsibility primarily, although not entirely, governance, and economic growth, in that order. If there is no security, there will not be good governance by almost definition. If there is not security and good governance, I do not believe you will get good economic growth. That's the proposition I put forward here today. Everything else, and I realize this is the contentious element, is secondary in my view. 
Whatever else there is in the assistance program is secondary to those three, or at least those two, governance and economic growth. So let's begin with the context. Five realities. First, on security. The objective is to defeat or contain the insurgency or to make it chronic and not existential. The insurgents have endured, although they've not been able to capture the state. There have been tactical victories, but an insurgency succeeds if it survives and is not defeated. It does not have to win in order to keep its momentum and to uh, threaten uh, the, the state and the order. There are splits within the Taliban, it's true, but they still persist notwithstanding all of these security efforts which I'm sure um, Dr. Korsman will be talking about. The Afghan national security forces are problematic, uncertain, doubtful quality, and, and uh, varying performance. According to General Dunford, they're under-trained, under-financed, under-motivated, and under-performing. They're also deeply corrupt, especially the police element. They're divided internally as a brittle collection of military units, some of which are divided by tribal and sectarian forces, others by who has what power and who can uh, gather what forces for economic reasons. There are minority officers, uh, or as for the, there are officers from the so-called minority parts of the population, actually not so minority, and large numbers of Pashtun troops. There are a variety of reports. ISAF is more optimistic. Uh, interna the International Security Assistance Force is much more uh, optimistic, but the rest of the uh, reports that we get from Congress, from uh, uh, the World Bank, from a whole variety of other sources are less optimistic. And we have insider attacks. Green on blue, initially now green on green. Troops attacking their own officers. The drawdown will be from 65,000 more if you look at the surge to somewhere between zero and 15,000 depending upon what the president decides. And that's if there's a bilateral security agreement. The coalition countries will also withdraw as the U.S. withdraws. Afghans are worried. There's an enduring strategic partnership agreement that we got in 2012. We maybe can get into that in the discussion, but most of the effort goes to the Afghan side, not so clear about what the strategic part for the U.S. and its allies are. Second, governance. Afghans do not expect Swiss government, they don't expect Danish government, they don't expect Norwegian government, but they expect something, some kind of decent government. The 2003 constitutional lawyer Jirga created a strong, unitary, highly centralized government with huge budgets, the 22 priority uh, um, projects, uh, all of which were provided by the donors none of which is consistent with Afghanistan's historic way of governing itself. Not impossible, but difficult. So instead of a federalist state or a confederalist state with a lot more localized uh, autonomy or at least a lot more localized authority, we created a, this highly centralized unitary state, very dependent on, on donor support. Decentralization, I think, is inevitable, if only for budgetary reasons. Corruption within the government is extremely high. Afghanistan ranks on, T on the Transparency International Index, which has, I realize, all kinds of critics. Nevertheless, it ranks last, along with North Korea and Somalia. Now, even if TI is wrong by an order of magnitude, Afghanistan is not going to be very high up. It's at, from the bottom. Uh, billions of dollars are being stolen every year, or millions by, almost by the day. Those with ties to the ark, to the palace, uh, are in patronage networks. There is poor performance on basic services, never mind exotic ones. The Asia Foundation survey finds very substantial disaffection with the government on performance. 
The Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction has report after report, quarter after quarter, one just a couple of days ago, outlining the difficulties of governance. 36% of the operating budget, 17% of the development budget is be has been spent. Among the ministries with development budgets of $50 million or more, only three, health, finance, and rural development, executed more than 20% of the budget they got in the first half of 2013. There's a growing financing gap, there's a growing trade gap, corruption is growing, not shrinking, and so on. On the economy, a lot rests, as I think, as I said, on security and governance. There has been rapid but somewhat artificial growth, especially in the cities. There are 500,000 new workers a year out of a total population of 30 million. So that's about 17% per year coming into, of the po total population coming into the labor force. Growing trade gap, sliding economy. If you are buying low and selling high, for a while you were investing in real estate in Kabul. You are now investing in real estate in Dubai. Many, many of, the, of the investments are going belly up, especially in real estate, which is an indicator of where the elite believes the future lies. There's a large expatriation of capital. Still, Afghanistan is a different country now than it was in 2001. Education levels are much higher. Workers have gone abroad. Consumer goods are now widespread. There's a large growth of population in the cities. It is a mistake to think of Afghanistan as a, as a country of small villages, each of which is isolated from one another. The underlying foundation, nevertheless, still endures. There is a new generation, which is the biggest asset I think Afghanistan has, and higher expectations among Afghans for their future. A fifth element of the reality is the neighbors, which perhaps we can leave for discussion. There's a fairly bit of discussion in the paper. Central Asia, Iran, Gulf states, China, Russia, and of course Pakistan. Whether they will leave Afghanistan alone is a question. Whether they'll help is not a question. On the other hand, Af the ANSF has done better. The security forces have done better than expected in this last electoral period. The elections went better than some people feared. Seven and a half million voters came out. We're due for round two. And so it looks like there's a road potentially to a credible, not perfect, not Swiss, not Norwegian, not Finnish, but credible election um, if we can keep, if the country can stay together. So what are the three scenarios and uh, what, is the sec what are the secondary programs as opposed to the primary ones? I'll try to run through this a bit quickly. The optimistic scenario is that there would be reasonably secure, stable, prosperous, well-governed, preferably democratic country. And the preferences are Afghan, not just foreign. By, a large number, by large margins, Afghans prefer a democratic future. President Obama, just a couple of months ago, said we're confident that we can prepare for any eventuality and that we can continue to maintain both counterterrorism commitments as well as commitments to help develop an Afghan, Afghan security force that can endure that Afghanistan does not end up being once again a safe haven for terrorism and that it can be a stable and secure country that serves the prosperity and security of the Afghan people. That's the current, uh, uh, among the current objectives. Um, I already read to you the Jiroa uh, goals for the, for the optimistic future, 2015, 2025, 2030. In the case of security, one hopes there would be general uh, control of the country, no major losses of territory, sporadic but limited violence, suicide bombings, uh, IEDs, ambushes, assassinations, and so on, but declining and chronic and uh, limited in the area in which they were taking place. On the governance side, there would be credible elections followed by decent performing government, limited to, base, to basic services probably, but act, that are actually provided. Substantially reduced corruption and nepotism, a much declined budget deficit and better budget execution, improved performance. The assembly, the National Assembly, the World Sejirga, 
Alessi Jorga rather, uh, will um, hopefully take a more active role and will uh, be a, a countervailing power to centralize executive power. And the media will continue to grow, which has been another bright spot. On the economic side, ec return to economic growth from the decline we've seen in the last couple of months stem the, exp the capital expatriation, yet there are few, Afghanistan enjoys few ca comparative advantages. Carpets are not going to be the road to Af economic growth in Afghanistan. Not enough carpet buyers to do that for 30 million people. Minerals are a possibility, but they need to be extracted and they need to be marketed out of the country, and that takes better security and better governments, which is would happen in the optimistic scenario. The Silk Road has been mooted, but uh, in my opinion, I think that Ambassador Newman may feel differently, is at best uh, an uncertainty, and it also depends entirely on security and good governance. The really brightest spot is the new generation of Afghans, uh, and the possibility of Taliban um, reconciliation. The assistance program, all variety of things are possible under the optimistic scenario, but still it seems to me the really core needs to be concentrated on. The muddling through scenario is much less, optim is much less optimistic by definition. So general security will be uh, provided by uh, the, the, the um, national security forces, but you'll be looking at a strategic stalemate. Neither the insurgency nor the government will strike a decisive defeat. Momentum will shift back and forth. Cities will be perhaps uh, controlled by the government and, uh, and the roads, but by day, the Taliban at night, most utilities will be at risk. Troop supply routes, economic infrastructure, and random violence will grow. Whether you need 10 to 1, 5 to 1, or 3 to 1 edge in counter security, it's un unlikely to be sustained over the long period of time by the national security forces, which will possibly fragment under the pressures of the uh, counterinsurgency. There will be no unitary state because the country will be divided into little enclaves, by definition, and many gains will be eroded, a downward cycle expectations and increased hedging. Taliban, the government, leaving the country emigration. A vicious cycle that will increase anxieties and also hedging behavior. Virtually no national government return to more local governance by definition, not a decentralization program because it won't be controlled by the government. Pockets of governance returning uh, as they used to be, but with different leadership, of course, and different structures. Religious leaders will reassert, religious will reassert themselves. Religious fundamentalism is likely to rise under that scenario, a reversion to the historical mean, Taliban controlled areas specific, especially uncertain in, in the economic side, uncertain security governance, virtually no national economy or growth, continued expectri expectriation, expe expectriation, expatriation of capital and hedging. Pessimistic scenario, uh, needn't go into very long. The, AN, the security forces look like they're losing. The Taliban gained momentum, race to safety, retreat to ethnic, religious, and communal preservation, impl possible implosion and collapse of the Afghan state. Power will be contested, partition, resurgence of fundamentalism, potentially return of this kind of split between the northern part of the country and the southern. Trade would be almost impossible, certainly hazardous, episodic, and very expensive. Afghanistan would become possibly a narco state, uh, and what would be left for assistance to do in both the muddling through and the uh, pessimistic scenario is to basically try to reinvigorate the governance and uh, economic growth part as best it can. But there's no point in talking about, in my view, Economic, uh, education, health, all the kinds of programs that are in the, in the uh, quiver now would not survive either a muddling through scenario or a pessimistic scenario. So what are the revised objectives? What are the conclusions? Uh, what should we be doing? Maybe we can keep this for the discussion, but uh, I think you're gonna wind up reverting at best to these three areas, security, governance, and economic growth. 
This the report that you have contains about 20 pages of conclusions and assistance recommendations, very notional and I realize simplistic scenarios. They should be better. We should try to develop better, more, more nuanced ones. And in light of those, our assistance programs perhaps would be different from the ones I've suggested, but I don't think radically. In effect, uh, there will be a much reduced, I think, set of possibilities. And I believe it would be best for us to concentrate on the core ones that have at least a shot at creating or supporting a potentially possibly optimistic scenario or at least one uh, that um, avoids the muddling through and pessimistic scenarios. Thank you, Jerry. Dr. Cordesman. Good afternoon, uh, morning, I should say. I'd like to <clears throat> talk mostly about the baseline in Afghanistan, but let me preface what I'm going to say with the fact that some 50 years into this, and at least now five or six major U.S. efforts at counterinsurgency, I'm always struck by the fact that we face three major enemies whenever we get into a counterinsurgency campaign. One is the threat. The other is the host country, which helped generate all of the conditions that led to the insurgency in the first place. And the third is the way we go to war, reinventing our plans on an annual basis, never really implementing any of them, lacking planners, lacking measures of effectiveness, and often just lacking basic accountability. Well, this is May of 2014. We are going towards transition with no plan for the military side, although we have a great many options, almost a new option every week in some variation, and no plan at all on the civil side other than to provide project aid in whatever form <clears throat> has sort of evolved over time. The sub-theme to all of this is we're pulling virtually everything out of the field. We're going to have to rely on contractors to measure performance, something which hasn't worked yet anywhere with any reliability. We are deeply committed to reducing not simply aid money, but military spending. Now, we're faking it this year in what's known as the OCO account. There's $77 billion, but an awful lot of it has nothing to do with the OCO account. It's just an effort to cheat on sequestration and the Budget Control Act. Then next year it drops to $30 billion, for which there is no plan. It's just a number, but that makes things look better to the Congress in terms of the overall budget deficit, which is the sole rationale for any of these figures. I really think our basic reality is going to be we will just barely get enough military advisors at best to keep the system running. And God knows what will happen with the civilian side on governance and on the aid. And here I think one of the most damaging things we do is deny that this is a very fragile developing country which is likely to have a lot of trouble in every aspect of transition and isn't going to develop for the next three to five years. And the basic problem is whether you can deal with both the military and the civil transition. Now, a couple of realities. The Afghan people are as concerned with corruption, unemployment, as they are with insecurity. They have been very consistently when it comes down to the security zone, none of the things that took place in Iraq are taking place in Afghanistan. The surge didn't work. ISAF had to stop all regular reporting on metrics and combat effectiveness. It has focused almost exclusively on tactical encounters over the last year, although there's no earthly reason why the Taliban should fight on unfavorable terms when they know we're leaving, and many of the indicators that really are relevant to a political and guerrilla warfare indicate that things are getting worse 
and not better. These are things like high-profile attacks. In terms of human development, <clears throat> this country is basically one of the worst in the world. It is not a country that has moved towards development, not in the classic sense, not when you look at the actual metrics involved. Education appears to be better in the HDI because the UN accepts the figures that are often given on education in Afghanistan, for which there is no credible source. Certainly things have gotten better, but there is no basis for these numbers that will survive even the slightest amount of practical examination. You have life expectancy rising. That is a good thing if you believe it, but only about half the sources actually show that this is taking place, and the UN has elements which directly disregard, disagree. And what is rather striking is that in real terms, the per capita income has not increased. And indeed, the World Bank sees a significant increase, not only in poverty, but in the distribution of income in ways which sharply encourage tension and problems within the country and will make it worse as military spending and aid go down. One way of looking at Afghanistan is how does it compare to Bangladesh and Nepal? And the answer is very, very badly. And these are not high standards of stability in comparison. Challenge of corruption. By all of the measures the World Bank uses, this is one of the worst governments in the world. It ranks in the worst five in all of the measures that are used by the World Bank. Is the World Bank right? Who knows? Quite frankly, when you start ranking bad governments, it is an art form of considerable uncertainty. But what is really a serious problem is that government effectiveness has not improved at a time that the Afghan government, in theory, is supposed to take over aid, planning, and management of the forces. And all of these ratings assume you have a government. And the little problem we face now is we don't know when, as a result of the election, we get a new government. We don't know what that government will be in the field, and we don't know how well it can operate. We do know that in many critical areas, including education, you simply don't have the people in the field. One key metric that came out of work done by the Department of Defense is the number of ghost schools that actually exist and where, which make that education figure many people focus on so suspect. But the problem is you're lacking people in the provinces you can count, and in many of the provinces you can't count your shortfall in the number of people in the field. Budget execution is a massive problem. Jerry already mentioned that, but what is really critical is that we had hoped that there would be an increase in revenues which would somewhat offset the probably cuts in aid and military spending. It hasn't taken place. In fact, it's moved in just the opposite direction. Revenues have dropped as both a percentage of government expenditure and as a percentage of the GDP. You've also seen a growing financing gap in terms of operations. There's no way this can change in 2014, 2015, or 2016. You simply don't have any way that you can show that this is a probability. The challenge of corruption isn't just Transparency International, it is the World Bank, it is survey data which incidentally show a very disturbing increase in corruption in the Afghan National Army over the last few years, and it is ratings by ISAF. Now this map of dark spots shows you increased areas of corruption, the bottom line, and this is available on the CSIS website, shows that you have had a steady increase in the perception of corruption over the last four years using an ISAF study. This is not a positive basis 
for change and reform. One of the key areas here is just plain demographic pressure. Jerry gave one figure for the number of people entering the labor force. Look, if we had a competent State Department and a competent USAID and something approaching transparency and integrity in the United States government, you would report the uncertainties in the figures you are using and you would show the range of estimates. The Afghan Central Statistics Office puts the current population at 27 million, of which 2.55 million are actually countable. Our Census Bureau puts it at about 3.8. Some estimates put it at about 35. Just think what all of these estimates of per capita income and all the rest really mean if the United States government had the integrity to show the range of uncertainty. And look at those life expectancy figures. One UN source is quoting 44 to 45 years. The World Bank is 64. The CIA is at 50. You are measuring one of the most critical aspects of our whole effort, aside from education, which is health, and your figures are essentially showing you that the range of estimates indicates we focus on the figure that is much the most flattering and the most positive without ever justifying or validating it. Divisive demographics, real. Economic challenges, Look, uh, one of the other dishonest things we have done as a government is to talk about GDP growth in the past few years when the rains were good. Now, for USAID and the State Department to take credit for high rainfall and agricultural output uh, is, applies certain capabilities in the State Department which may have existed when Ron was ambassador but I somehow think are missing today. When it comes down to what you have, this GDP and economy is absolutely critically dependent on outside spending and aid. In theory, next year, 50% of the outside money should go through the central government. Right now, it has no capacity to do that. No one would argue this government is ready to spend the money. And if any of you really believe that the speed with which you can spend your budget is a measure of effectiveness in government, I'd like to see you about your investment profile after this meeting. Uh, the fact is it's an absolutely meaningless metric of performance. This is essentially, that green line simply tells you something about the GDP. It goes up when it rains. It goes down when it doesn't rain. It has nothing to do with aid or development activity by the U.S. government or UNDP or anybody else. World Bank estimate, it will not meet anything like the growth rates needed to employ people entering the labor force or deal with existing unemployment or poverty problems through at least 2016. There's no way mines, the Silk Road, anything else can really change that very much. And yes, these are the World Bank estimates of poverty, and look, it's going up. It's not going down. In real terms, again, the other great problem is because we've had such poor controls on the way we have spent money in Afghanistan, it has deeply corrupted people within the market sector, the people who benefited as contractors, builders, and in government from an uncontrolled amount of aid and wartime spending. It's inflated and created major problems for people who are in the market economy in cities, increasing their vulnerability something the World Bank has been pretty blunt about. Improvements as part of the Tokyo Accord, zero. 
All of the metrics that people have talked about in terms of Afghan reform and the Tokyo Accord have essentially been related to holding elections, not the economy and not the quality of governance. In terms of the World Bank assessment of what the private sector can do, 164th out of 189, this country is going nowhere on the basis of those barriers unless it can get them down in a hurry and open things up to its own market sector. And let me just conclude with opium. For all the bullshit about our counter narcotics program, and excuse the use of a technical term you may not be fully familiar with, what you have really seen is a massive recent increase in narcotics output, a massive, much more massive increase in the area under cultivation, a reversion of much of the Helmand area the Marine Corps liberated to Taliban and narco control, and frankly, in the first World Bank real look at this, an honest assessment. One way you can lie to everybody about your effectiveness is to only measure drugs in terms of farm gate prices. Because guess what? The farmers don't get anything. The minute you shift it around to the narcotics estimate in terms of the actual impact on the economy, goes from about 5% of the GDP to 15%. So, Jerry's options? If we're gonna make anything work, let me just conclude with one statement. You don't do it with a liar's contest. Brian, it's up to you to find something good about us, about something. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador Newman. I, I, I did note these analyses were a little bit dire. Um, well, none of them are mine. Yeah. And there's a lot in there which I agree. There, there is a funny paradox, of course, that the, I think the overwhelming sentiment in a large piece of Afghanistan right now is, is measured optimism, or perhaps unmeasured optimism, um, which clashes remarkably with our presentation today, which doesn't suggest the presentation necessarily is wrong. Uh, but they have just come through an election in which despite, well, they've come through the first phase of an election, they got a second phase to go and we'll see how the shoes drop. But uh, you know, the Afghan security forces performed credibly, albeit for a limited period of time with a limited mission. Not You can exaggerate everything. But they managed adequate security and you had twice as many people voted as in the last one. And we've got lots of problems to go. and. I'm simply saying that as a matter of sort of Afghan sentiment, it clashes with the analysis. The analysis may still well be right. There's a lot in this with which I agree. Um, I certainly agree that the Washington civilian use of the word strategy is noticeably lacking in intellectual content. Um, and it's likely to continue. Um, I agree, I agree greatly that I, with this business of what's going to happen in terms of war is continuing, I, I shudder, I just loathe it every time we say we are ending the war. We are ending our military participation in a nasty, vicious struggle that is going on and we're gonna leave it to others. And that would be another place where a little honesty would be useful, if perhaps not politically uh, helpful. Um, but I, I want to go to the report, and I'm going to be a little contrarian in a couple of respects, uh, partly because the panel will be boring if everybody agreed, but uh, also because I think there are a couple of fundamental things one needs to add. One is I think there is, with all respect to a lot of good stuff in here, there is one very large hole and it's a hole that I see repeatedly in our analysis and CIA products and in many of our strategic discussions, and that is it doesn't treat what we do as a major component of what happens. Um, if we decide to have a decision about a larger number of troops, if we manage to keep up our funding, 
Uh, these have consequences that are psychological as well as individual, military, or economic. And I think we do a lot of analysis in this town as though those guys are over there and we're over here and we figure out what we think the situation is and then we have a policy about that situation rather than seeing what is really the dynamic of policy is often a kind of continually reacting circle. And that is particularly the case in Afghanistan where there's a huge psych sort of tightly wound psychology where people constantly, I would say, constantly overreact. They overreact bad, they overreact good. We signed the strategic partnership agreement, signed the strategic partnership agreement, which has almost nothing in it. It's really pretty vanilla, you know, and real estate prices jump 15% in a week. Uh, something bad happens, everybody's down in the mouth. But these psychological swings have consequences. So that doesn't necessarily mean things will be better because I'm not all that optimistic about the policy choices that this administration is continually refusing to make for no particularly good reason. Um, but the fact is that any analysis of the future needs to look at the reaction mode of what we do as well as what happens in Afghanistan. Leaving, leaving that out, I simply submit as a whole. Um, and then I'm going to be really bizarre because Washington is obviously a town that loves policy and strategy even if they don't know what it is. And I'm going to suggest that maybe this is actually not the time to make big strategic choices. Let me come back to that in a minute, talk just about a few details in the report. By the way, on Tony's comment on Helmand, which is a very particular little detail, there's a largest report coming out from David Mansfield. It's not correct to say that Helmand opium production is up in the areas the Marines secured. What you have is a, you do have a massive production, but what you have is a new settlement north of the canal and ground that didn't exist before. What you've actually got is a considerable success of the areas in which people fought in an ever-evolving situation. Now, that doesn't make things good. I'm not saying that. But when we go around saying, oh, everything we've done is a failure. Tony didn't say that, and neither did Jerry. But it is a, a frequent kind of doleful clamor um, in the punditry. By the way, you know what the definition of pundit is. That's somebody who's never uh, frequently wrong but never uncertain. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so he, the fact is there's been a good deal of success in the strategy. It doesn't tell you whether you're winning or losing because it doesn't tell you whether the Afghans can hold it. But when you compare Kandahar in 2008 or 9 with the Taliban on the gates practically of the city and massive numbers of bombing a day with Kandahar today where you held massive election rallies that were secured by the Afghans without incident, where you have a growth in the Afghan local police in some of the most problematic districts that we fought in for seven years with huge losses, and now you have people that are standing up and they're fighting the Taliban and they're doing reasonably well. Some of them are also politically corrupt. There are all sorts of issues. But the fact is that when you go around and look at the districts in Kandahar, that not everything's good, but it is a hell of a lot better than it was three years ago. That tells you absolutely nothing about whether you will succeed or fail over the longer run. But it is important when one gets sort of flapping the hands. One thing that I think is important is, I agree, the scenarios are you know, crude, but you know, any kind of scenario in a place as complicated as Afghanistan is going to be crude. The likelihood is something between a couple of them. There is no question, and it came out in the report, it comes out in Tony's figures as well, that governance and economy, economic growth are really important. Having said that, these are two of the hardest areas to implement, and we have continually for the last umpteen years, actually since about, at least since about 2003 when improving governance appeared first in General Barno's campaign plan, um, we put these things down with absolutely no notion of what it is we're going to do about them, and then we tend to be very short range in our focus. The result is we waste an enormous amount of time 
by a refusal to deal with the fact that some things just take a long time to do anything. So if you're going to do economic growth, there are no good short-range strategies. You can dump money into cash for work and other things, but most of those have been failures. The, the real things, and they may, you may not be able to bring them off, that's a separate question, but that you need to look at in economic development are things like power and roads. If you don't have power, you cannot have competitive light industry and anything produced by any of the neighbors because their power costs are so much lower. That brings you in, to, you know, by the way, note, I reoriented a lot of our aid to power and roads. I am not a disinterested observer in the defense of this program. Uh, but I would still argue that it is correct whether every piece done under its correct is, is also a separate issue. But most of what you need to do for economic development is long-term. There are no short-term fixes. You can throw up your hands and say we should quit. That is one option. Um, but our constant search for the short-term has meant that we have plowed incredible amounts of money into some areas that are just plain stupid, and others where we have fueled corruption because we have piled so much money into areas that it can't possibly be absorbed. And what that does is to just foment more corruption. So if you're going to be serious about this, you have to take a longer term perspective. Um, I do think the scenarios and the discussion is a bit too pessimistic in one respect. Um, there is a statement in there that it's hard to see any scenario by which the ASF will maintain the ground, let alone defeat the insurgency. I agree that it is not likely to defeat the insurgency, particularly because of the existence of sanctuaries. But to say that there is hardly any scenario by which they will maintain the ground, this seems to me excessive. Um, they've done better than that in the last year. In fact, I would say in fighting terms, they have done probably better than most American military I know would have expected a year or two ago would be the case today. Now, I don't know what that tells you about tomorrow. And, and Afghanistan is a place where if you have a strong view, you can find the examples that fit it. Um, reminds me of Tony and my first encounter with these sorts of wars in Vietnam. Um, an extraordinarily complex situation of all kinds of different parts so that if you have a really strong view, you can go to Afghanistan, you can find the pieces that fit, you can come back and write the article that says, I was there and it's this way. But if you have a view that's 180 degrees out, you can do exactly the same thing. Um, but I think it's a little too pessimistic on the ASF, but they they could come apart. You've also left out another, uh, another issue, which is you could have a coup. Um, which would not be totally surprising four or five down, years down the road, maybe less or more, if you continue to have governance bad as you have now, to have an increasingly professionalized uh, army at the middle or upper middle fetal grades, which is held in, down by a, as you pointed out, more corrupt uh, officer class, and which has to do the fighting. That is a scenario in which a coup is not uh, impossible maybe even not unlikely, but right now they're not doing so badly. Uh, and they are more interested in fighting, I think, than the Afghans, the, the Iraqis. But we have another problem which we have to handle right now, frankly, I think in Afghanistan and here, but in different respects, and that's going to actually be managing excessive expectations. With the Afghans, it's because things are going a little bit better and they then expect too much. With us, I think the problem will be that with a new government, we will expect it to do way too much, way faster than it can possibly do anything. The new president, whoever he turns out to be, is going to have a very narrow base of really loyal supporters, and then a larger base of rather temporary supporters that got him into office and now all want a job. And then a number of folk that he knows he's got to bring into government because every candidate knows, every, I mean, I was just there two months ago and I saw all the major candidates. They all said, if I'm elected, I have to bring in more people 
who are outside my support base in order to form, if not a unitary government, something that has a broader support. Getting all those people squared away in jobs is going to be an interesting, uh, interesting issue. And given the balancing that will take place, it's not a scenario in which you're suddenly going to clean up the act. Now, it doesn't mean it can't get better, and in fact, I think, I think they all know it has to get better. Whether they can do it, I don't know. Uh, but if we suddenly march in and want to hold the new government as it gets organized responsible for everything that Mr. Karzai has created in the last few years, I think that would be a very unfortunate choice of strategy. I am going to suggest that we should hold off on big strategy right now. I mean, this is, of course, totally contrary to the way this town functions. But in fact, new strategy has got to be settled with the next Afghan government. Not always in the sense of just doing things that they want, but it needs to come out of some kind of realistic discussion with the next president, rather than being yet another made in Washington creation which will inevitably take in no account of what is realistic and what is not realistic. This is not new, this administration or Afghanistan. I noticed there was a comment in the, a book by the late Bill Colby about Vietnam, about some policy designed in Washington, which he said was absolutely never going to be possible or accepted by DM because of his Mandarin background. Of course, Washington decided on it and did it anyway. 50% um, of the problems we've had with President Karzai are because we have been totally deaf to either what he was about or how he interpreted what we were about. If we continue in that way, then I guess my predictions will become as dire as everybody else's. But the, we need right now, in my judgment, to do two or three key things. We need to settle the decision about what we expect to do on troop numbers and dollars. We may not be able to produce all the dollars, but there is a profound unsettling consequence of our long delay. And that's our fault. That's not Afghanistan. That's not anything that's in these scenarios. It is the incompetence of our refusal to make decisions which need weight on nothing. The argument that we cannot make a troop decision until we have signed a bilateral security agreement is a political argument. It is factually and legally bogus. There is absolutely no reason our troops cannot remain beyond the end of December this year because we have a perfectly serviceable status of forces agreement which has no expiration date. Um, now, it's not a good solution, but the idea that we're up against some hard barrier is a fiction. Um, and it would help immeasurably if we would decide what it is we're prepared to do because the current approach is a little bit of, you Afghans sign this sucker and then we'll tell you what we're gonna do. It's a little bit like saying, Write the check, and then I'll tell you how the car you're buying is going to be equipped. <clears throat> I don't know anybody that would buy a car on that basis, but we expect the Afghans to buy a national security agreement, um, which I think is silly, as you might have noticed. We need, so we need to get that piece out, even if we don't have agreement, so everybody knows what we are talking about, which would have a certain stabilizing factor. We need to think about a few key points. We are trying to pump too much money through the ministries too fast, and we need to stop saying, if you don't do this or that, so we'll change. We need to make the change now. It's not, this is not gonna affect the governance that much, but it's a matter of recognize we're out ahead of what they can manage and scale it back, and scale it back in the places that they're doing worst with the promise that you can reverse it if they do better, which is much more effective, frankly, than a yet another statement of potential threat, which we generally don't carry <coughs> out. Um, think about a few key points that are going to be important to us in the transition, of which I would say there are very few, but two of them are probably the characters of the ministers of defense and interior that will be appointed. On those, we have some need at least to consult. We shouldn't be trying to veto, but 
or we shouldn't be trying to pick, but we do need to consult because if those people are really hopeless, we're in trouble. But beyond that, we need to stand back. We need to let the new government get established. And then we need to discuss within our very increasingly limited means what we can do to help them, what they're prepared to do for themselves, where we can, where we can work together, and what are reasonable expectations. And out of that come to a more articulated strategy. I think it is a mistake to try to do that on the basis of scenarios that neglect one big issue, our own, our own decisions. And on that, I will pause. I think it's terribly terrific. Uh, let's turn well, to the I've, audience. I've matched Afghan incompetence with Americans, so we now have synergy. <laughs> let's uh, turn to the audience for a little bit, and we'll save the last five minutes for kind of a wrap up up here. Uh, questions, please. Maybe some of the audience has something uh, good to say. Please. Microphone. Thanks, Frank Miller. I just got back from Afghanistan from being there since 2004, in and out. Uh, thank you so much for your panel. It's wonderful thinking. And in seeing a lot of ways and a lot of actions. And I'm here to tell you, coming from the ISAF level and the embassy level, and the statistics that you're laying out, a lot of those came from evals that had to be written for senior leaders and other leaders in order to make them do their right jobs and look good in their, the way they're doing their jobs. But I will tell you that I think that what, I'm very optimistic, I, so you know, right up front. Wow. Um, but I'm optimistic from the perspective of the picture of right that I see, which is long term. And I think that your muddling theory is probably correct it needs to be leadership, uh, leadership and organized muddling, because that's where it's going to go for the next few years. And using the Afghans as the Afghan base for how we do any of the support that we want to do. Uh, we do an awful lot from a Western perspective, and I agree with um, Ambassador Newman, uh, wanting to try to do things way too fast. We need to know what that definition of right looks like, along with the picture of right, and how many years down the road that might be, and certainly not tomorrow or even next year or two to three or five years from now. But uh, again, just a comment. Uh, thank you so very much. Your thinking is wonderful. I've seen several of you as you moved around the city here and, and in Afghanistan, and I appreciate all your help. Thank you. Anybody else like to make a comment, ask a question? Young lady. Yes, thank you. And I apologize that I arrived late, but I was um, talking to my colleagues in Afghanistan. I, I work for a contractor, PAE, and uh, we implement, my program implements um, a justice sector reform program in Afghanistan. And what I wanted to add is that from my little perspective where I sit, I think that we are cautiously optimistic. Um, I don't think the U.S. government has made a great um, uh, advertisement of what it actually is accomplishing in Afghanistan. And I will be quite honest, I think that what we have done is Afghanize the project. We started out with 90% American and international legal experts. We support the criminal justice sector in Afghanistan. And today, um, 2014, Almost 90% of the people who work in this program are Afghans, Afghan lawyers, Afghan judges, Afghan subject matter experts in budgeting, procurement, and other areas. So I see a little wedge. We have about 500 people working for us, and we have done regional work, and I think I tend to side more with Ambassador Newman we are cautiously optimistic, but our Afghan workers and employees are, uh, see a future. They risk their lives to come to our camp. That says something. Thank you. Thank you. Let's try to keep everything to about 30 seconds. Back in the back, please. Okay. Um, Stanley Kober. I'm concerned about the access to Afghanistan. I'm looking at an article in Defense News 
NATO turns to airlift following increased convoy attacks in Pakistan. And the Northern Distribution Network now also seems in trouble because of our problems with Russia. So what kind of access can we count on to Afghanistan? One more question? Yes, please. Back. Uh, Irving Rosenthal, American University. Where in the U.S. government is this discussion going on? Uh, where should it be? Um, maybe that's my question. Why don't we try to respond to those quickly? Tony? Very quickly, I think that <clears throat> to the extent we have a planning effort, it does take place in the Pentagon. It does take place in ISAF. One of your great problems is not that we don't have options or plans or that the ANSF won't work if they're implemented, but I would have to say that we've waited and waited and waited on a decision as to whether we'll have enough advisors and enough money to keep the ANSF running. And that probably takes somewhere between 10 and 13,000 advisors, and it's going to take somewhere between four and five billion dollars a year for several years. And it isn't quite clear anybody's programmed that, but there's no question you have the plans for it. On the civil side, you haven't got any. You basically will just go forward with project aid, and you will keep doing whatever you're doing regardless of the needs. The difficulties we face on that side is what we don't plan for, is what happens when all that money that has been flowing into the country begins to really run down, which is mid-2015 to end 2015 because of lead times. We don't know what happens to the market sector, how much the cutoff on money really produces serious internal problems. It's an experiment, like prohibition. You find out the hard way. You've been warned by the World Bank you may need a major bailout, and Ron points out you better keep spending because they're not going to get any wiser or any better overnight. But we haven't really made that case to the Congress or anyone else or figured out what kind of money is needed. And we've done no realistic assessment of what the flow of international aid will be. Remember, we're not the only country involved. If we're not estimating our own aid, we don't know. Again, one has to be careful. If you assume that this is a very poor, undeveloped country, and it's suddenly going to lose a lot of outside support, but not all of the critical support, it's going to be pretty much what it is, only slightly worse for at least a few years. And that's not the end of the world unless the Taliban wins. Uh, the caution I would give you on some of this, one of the questions was about roads. The fact is, it's not just access in a security sense. You don't have any meaningful trade between Afghanistan and its neighbors relative to Afghan imports. Uh, one critical issue is if all that money that's been poured into the country suddenly disappears given their current budget and their current costs, you don't need to worry about access. You need to worry about outside money. The other difficulty is increasingly, are you actually maintaining the roads inside Afghanistan and can you secure them? Now, I think General Dunford's concept of layered defense potentially will keep the critical LOCs running within the country. But for example, Ron mentioned Kandahar, and it is positive, but the road between Kandahar and Kabul is becoming a serious problem through lack of maintenance. You have problems like the Salang Tunnel. These aren't long-term problems, they're immediate. But my guess would be that the countries around Afghanistan are probably going to keep some kind of access going within the limits of the existing domestic Afghan economy. We're not planning to move that much stuff in anymore. So airlift, the kind of capacity we're probably going to retain, will be enough for the U.S. component. How well that will work out? Uh, well, again, it's an experiment. We've got a lot of questions for Jerry. Let me just say a couple things. One on 
I don't know the answer on the latest convoy attacks, but I know having looked at some of the past ones that the news reports have tended to exaggerate the impact uh, of the flow of the Pakistani network. And I basically agree with Tony that, that this is not dire in terms of our needs. On U.S. government decision making, uh, on the civilian side, that is making the key political decisions, this is locked up in the White House. There are, my understanding is that there is a fair amount of agreement between state, defense, and JCS on what they would prefer, and those decisions are understood but not liked, uh, and the White House has not found a decision it does like that does not also spell some form of disaster, and therefore it is uh, standing there. It will eventually make a decision, but that's where, you know, the, and it's a big decision, and it matters, and it's going to be made by the president when he's ready to make it or can't avoid it any longer, whichever comes first. Um, on the aid issues, just one issue is how we're going to supervise much of anything, which we can't figure out without knowing what we're going to do with troops and mobility. So that's a in a way of stasis. Second is to, well, I think it's also important to recognize with respect to the Special Inspector General, many of whose criticisms are correct, some of whom I think are overdrawn. We have never tried to have this degree of accountability in a war. God only knows what, you know, SIGR for Europe would look like if we'd done this in World War II. Um, but the fact is we're, you know, we're trying to have peacetime fiduciary management in a wartime situation and there's a, there's a contradiction or there's a tension between the goals and we are in Congress and in the public discussion completely unwilling to adjust or to deal with that tension. Finally, within aid itself, there is a much larger problem which is not of aid's making, and that is aid is too small to do much of anything itself. It's a little bigger now, <clears throat> but it's still not more than max 20% of what AID was when I first visited Afghanistan in 1967. It cannot carry out projects itself. It can only contract, and there are big there are big problems with the contractor model, which are not problems of malfeasance, but they are problems of the way you adjust the problems. You hire a contractor to do what you paid the contractor to do, and very rarely would the contractor be thanked by telling you that you've actually hired them to do the wrong job uh, because they've discovered some other problem. Uh, it is slow to react. It, it has a huge amount of overhead. But unless aid is significantly not only reorganized but strengthened in personnel, you cannot break out of the contractor mode. So we deal with symptoms, but we don't want to deal with cause. Jerry, one minute. <laughs> Please. We have a lot of questions. I understand that. But, um, there are a lot of points that got raised here. Um, Please, keep it going. We only have 15 minutes. Um, okay. A uh, couple couple points. One is, uh, it seems to me, the, the, the question of options and scenario planning is precisely the point of why I wrote the, the document. I think you need to have scenario planning. You need to not be able to say, here's what's going to happen, but what happens here, what happens there, what happens in the next thing? How do we react to the following scenarios? It seems to me that's uh, particularly, uh, that's, that's an important feature of planning that we don't have. Secondly, when we say don't make strategic choices now, it's quite possible you don't make the strategic choice now, but you have these scenarios on hand to, that will guide those strategic choices. The one element of why the strategic, some strategic choice is necessary now is the declining budget. Unless you think that the budget is going to stay on track, you're going to have to make some strategic choices. And I think that's the premise, uh, I think, that the budget is going to go down. And if, if that's not the case, then you may well be in a different uh, scenario of planning because of our own effect on the ground, as you pointed out. One element that I didn't get a chance to mention, government plans if, in an optimistic scenario to have a reconciliation with the Taliban. If you have a reconciliation with the Taliban, you're going to get Taliban at best, Taliban ministers in a government that they have now agreed to enter, at best. 
So the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Education, the Minister of Health is going to be a Mullah Omar person. Now Mullah Omar claims he's, he's, he's uh, learned some lessons, but he hasn't spelled out what they are, and I'm worried that they might not be the right lessons from the point of view of an optimistic <clears throat> outcome in, in, in the country. Conditionality. It seems to me that if you're going to go with a variety of uncertainties, then you better have some idea about what conditions you're willing to accept and what conditions you're not. And that has to be serious. It can't be the usual conditionality of the donor community, which says, you know, if you climb up that tree, Johnny, I'm going to, you know, you're not going to get dessert. Johnny climbs up the tree, and the dessert comes out anyway. Well, that's not a good, then you shouldn't have made that condition in the first place. If you're going to make it, stick to it. And it seems to me you're going to have to lay down some of those conditions in order for, the, the, for these scenarios to play out. Monitoring evaluation is critical. Last point for the moment, anyway, until the next round, maybe, is that, to me, one serious question that Afghanistan has raised and Iraq after three insurgencies in my lifetime, and in some of the lifetimes of some of you around here, others too young, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. It's not obvious to me that we can fight an, Afghan an insurgency and do assistance at the same time. And that gets to your last point. That is the most serious, in my opinion, bottom line question. Can we do this? And if not, then we should avoid getting into these kind of situations and expect something different. We've had three examples, corruption, all of the kinds of things, all the dysfunctions have been there, we're in all three of these cases. And we ought to ask ourselves, well, if they're in three, why do you think the fourth will be any different? All right, sir, please. Just wait, wait for the microphone, right behind you. I'm Tom Niblock. I'm with the State Department. I was in Kabul from seven until 11. Uh, I've been at the Pentagon since then. One of our ambassadors asked a few years ago, what does success look like? And I appreciated the panel members' uh, comment on Bangladesh, and I did him a slide of social indicators, and I said, if in about 15 years Afghanistan looks like Bangladesh today, that's successful. Um, somewhere about nine, 2009, 2010, we got way away from that kind of thinking, and we imposed a time constraint that, that was utterly unrealistic. My views shade very much, I think, towards Ambassador Newman's, but I appreciate the comments and the cautions of the other panel members. I, I appreciated the plug on the Afghan media. I think that's been an extraordinarily positive element, and we saw that most recently in the elections. Um, going forward, a lot less money, a lot fewer people. Uh, we need to think more in terms of reasonable time frames, uh, as well as uh, uh, holding their feet to the fire. And those plans, I had to uh, sort of smile on that one. We wrote most of those plans along with our European partners in extraordinary detail and at great cost. Thank you. Please, right here. Hi, good morning. My name is Leanne Rios, and I'm with the United Nations Development Program. Um, I've recently returned from Afghanistan three weeks ago, where I spent two and a half years, or two years, excuse me. Um, my question is, or my statement really is, that uh, I appreciate everything that has been mentioned because I think it all has uh, merit. Um, but working with the UNDP in Afghanistan, we're embedded within the ministries, and I've seen the impact that ODA has. Um, we worked, the particular ministry that I worked with works on rural development. So we do sustainable energy, road production, all of that. I'm just curious why the U.S. government doesn't engage more with multilaterals that are already on the ground. I know that we obviously have issues as well, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that we have access uh, to areas that the U.S. government simply does not. Um, and UNDP in particular is taking over uh, some of the development programs that the PRTs have uh, implemented uh, within some of the areas in which they're located. So, so if, if the panel can just maybe address um, why multilaterals are not used more often in terms of development. 30 seconds, please. I just want to respond to the lady. I just came back from Kabul too. Uh, regarding working with multilaterals, USAID has committed $475 million on on-budget projects through ADB. So ADB is handling a good chunk of money that USAID uh, is uh, allocating, for, mostly for energy. 
I talked to ADP when I was there. I talked to USAID. So these are the correct numbers. Thank you, Richard Lee Smith from the British Embassy. Could I ask about um, US and NATO core interests in Afghanistan post 2014, what, what you think those are and how they compare to the region, um, which is something I think we haven't talked about. Um, I mean, there's, I think there's an interesting paragraph in your conclusions at, on the report to US policy towards Pakistan, but I'd be interested in how you see the balance of US interests in the region post-2014 and what that means for your policy recommendations for Afghanistan and the wider region. Thank you. Two more questions, two more points. In the back. Anshuman Apte, uh, Voice of America, Afghanistan Service. My question is uh, both to Ambassador Newman as well as uh, Mr. Hyman. Uh, if you could put this report in perspective of the recent elections and a future Afghan government that uh, will be sworn in. How do you see all your findings and your expectations from the new government? Is, is the situation still uh, salvageable? Do you see a hope from the new Afghan government that will be sworn in? Uh, and I would like uh, Ambassador Newman to comment on the uh, same issue as well, please. Let's squeeze in one more. No more? Gentlemen. Tony? Uh, let me just say one key thing about aid to Afghanistan and where we're headed. We aren't in a mode where the United States government can simply throw money at good intended projects or programs. You really have to know what's going to happen to the Afghan economy as this massive flow of military spending, which was far more important than aid spending, by a factor of seven or eight, goes down. You have to see what gets hurt. And if necessary, you have to bail out the parts that get hurt to the extent they involve young men with guns or critical aspects of government or the order and structure of the society. The fact is that most project and program aid is just buying sort of popularity. It doesn't matter whether it's SERP or anything else. It doesn't have any lasting economic impact. It fades with monotonous regularity, and it does so regardless of whether you have a coin environment. And that's particularly true if you have an agency like USAID, which has promised, what was it, seven years ago? No, that's not fair. Four years ago, yet again to develop effectiveness measures and hasn't. Uh, core interests, let me say this gets down to a really critical problem I can't answer right now. Tell me where the Ukraine is going to be at the end of the year. Tell me about U.S. overall budgeting. How much are we going to be able to spend on Central Asia, Afghanistan, and Pakistan relative to the Middle East or Asia? We are not critically short on resources, but we have a lot of conflicting priorities. Is Afghanistan a central factor in the war on terror? No. It's a very marginal, very low priority relative to even Pakistan, and Pakistan is pretty low compared to virtually all the other key centers of terrorism today. Are you going to go on with this? The question has got to be reevaluated every year. <clears throat> you, this is, as is everything else in international relations, a sunk cost. And triage has to be fairly ruthless. But <clears throat> Bangladesh in 15 years, I think maybe it even might do better. But look, what is the key punchline of this panel? I'm not even sure Ron would disagree. If Afghanistan bad enough under something approaching a reasonably democratic government and without Taliban control, that's fine. It isn't going to be a developing country. It isn't going to be a radical improvement in governance. And an awful lot of the efforts that we started, if not most, during the course of this war are going to fade into oblivion, and Afghanistan is going to be Afghanistan again. It may change over time, but it isn't just a matter of not selecting new strategies. What you see today, if you're lucky, 
is what you're going to get sometime between 2016 to 2018. Jerry? All right, a couple of points. Um, one is on the question of accomplishments in media. I agree, media is an uh, accomplishment. And I don't want to say that there haven't been lots of accomplishments by lots of, of uh, NGOs and, and companies. The question is whether that's all going to get swept away in the security, governance, and economic growth mixture. If women, all, all of those kinds of gains, no doubt about it. But are they sustainable if the security environment decrease, de de degrades, if the governance continues to, to the way it is or gets worse, and the, ec and the economy doesn't, doesn't pick up? Because th the assumption of the, my paper is that the budget is going down. The U.S. assistance budget and that of all of the coalition countries is going to go down. Now, if that's not the case, if it's going to double, maybe we can talk about that. But I didn't include that, that whole because I didn't think it was even on the table. I mean, I can't imagine anyone doubling the, the assistance budgets. As to the core interest, there's a, I thought you were going to pick that one up, that statement in, in the paper, uh, and disagree with it. And I, I, I think I said in the paper, I don't think Afghanistan is anywhere near the core interest of the United States. In my opinion, I'll maybe be a little bit, uh, uh, since I've been so humble and bra unbrash, I'll be a little more brash now. In my opinion, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Afghanistan was an emotional more than a geostrategic response. We got hit, and we wanted to react. And I, I certainly don't, I was not different from that. But the result was that we wound up hugely, hugely engaged in a country that does not have long-term strategic significance, even on terrorism. It's now moved to lots of other places. And if you talk about the pivot or the rebalancing from Europe to Asia, the rebalancing from Afghanistan is going to be like a whiplash. There's just not going to, there's no constituency for continued assistance in, in, in a large scale in Afghanistan, in my personal view, and it doesn't, it's, it's national security uh, relationship to the United States doesn't warrant it. So I personally think that's yet another reason that that, in my opinion, is not going to happen. Um, why don't I leave it there? By, by my watch, we've got two minutes till we have to let these folks go, which probably precludes profound answers. But um, As to the ones a couple of points. I agree the budgets are probably going down. I do not agree that this is an automatic function. There is room for leadership. Now, if you want to take as a premise of scenario that we will continue to have no leadership, that the president will continue to have some residual force engaged in a war but will make no effort to lead it, that is a premise you can make. It might be the correct one. But it's not an automatic function. Uh, there is the opposition to Afghanistan or the discomfort is broad, but it is weak. Uh, it is not deep. And some of it, it we're seeing reversing with some of the recent um, Republic Boner's recent comments suggest that there is room there for maneuver. So I, I think it is too dire just to treat it as you are, although I agree, you, you, you may actually be right about where it comes out, but not in this automatic sense. Secondly, on this basic question of scenarios, it does not, I agree we're going to have tough choices. I agree with Tony, we need to look at where they're going to hurt. I think it's important to note that when you try to make that analysis, it's extremely speculative. There are all kinds of things you're not going to know. You're going to get pieces of it wrong, which goes to another issue in our bureaucratic culture that we don't want to accept failure. And we need to understand that in these kind of situations, having a learning organization and reacting to it is often a matter of seeing what doesn't work and adjusting rather than treating that as failure because that's a dynamic which tends to put people in the mode of defending bad programs rather than admitting failure so that you go on with a bad program longer. Um, but you're very limited. So, I, I think we're out of time. Um, I don't agree on the, really on the core issues, but it's a long, it's a long discussion with, for which we do not have time. I would say that I think 
the cost of a very large perceived failure is much more severe to our core interests than possibly anything we can get out of any short-term success. But I, I think the debate needs to broaden somewhat to cost of failure as well as need for success. But we're out of time, and I will rest at that point. Can I just say one last one sentence. And that is that the future of these decisions is now going to be not in the U.S. hands or in the hands of the, of the coalition governments. It's now going to rest in the hands of the Afghan government That's and the point. Afghan people. What kind of government do they want? What kind of society do they want? What are they willing to pay for it? What are they willing to do? These are not going to be Washington decisions, in my opinion. These are going to be uh, decisions much, much, much more made in Afghanistan than they have been in the past. And the sort of attempt to impose a whole variety of programs and structures and governments and this and that and the next is going to come, I believe, to a, not a halt, but a, a, a dramatic decline. And so the question, in my opinion, of what's going to happen, Bangladesh or not, is going to be in the hands of much more of the government of Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan it has in the past. Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the panel. It was a mistake to require.